We are in, we are look, uh, we're studying Satanology. The study of Satan. Um, Satan, the word Satan means something. I can't remember what it means. Somebody look that up. In uh, Swahili, it's Shatani. Yes, it's Satan in a lot of places in the world. Satan are ver- versions of the word Satan. Um, accuser? Adversary, yeah. Um, I just, I have in my mind, I, I'll find this maybe between tonight and next Sunday. Um, there was a rock group, heavy metal group, back in the 70s called Black Oak, Arkansas. And um, groups did this for real. They, um, they were following some of the teachings of Aleister Crowley, who was a big-time Satanist. And Crowley um, encouraged people in their worship of Satan to do things backwards. Um, say things backwards, count things backwards, or whatever. And there's actually a biblical precedent for that, when you, if you study the word backward uh, or back in the Bible, you'll, you'll find some neat things there. Going backward takes you to Mount Sinai, you're under the law. Going forward puts you under Mount Zion, New Jerusalem, you're under grace. But anyway, they, had, uh, they were doing a live performance and of some song, I don't remember, I'll have to look into what it was. But in this live performance, uh, guy's doing a drum solo and all of a sudden the lead singer comes up to the microphone and the other band members are screeching and howling and everything else and he goes, Natas! Natas! Dogs he eat! Dogs he eat! And you play it backwards, he is saying, Satan, Satan, he is God, he is God. Oh yeah, oh yeah. The, and they, that was, a, that was a, an example of them deliberately saying something backwards. And, you know, and the idea is you play it backwards on your record player. Now it's, I can do it on a computer very easily. And um, you can hear these things. There were, a, there were other examples of studio versions of songs where the, uh, the backward words were pretty, um, they, they were very understandable. It's like, it's like either they trained themselves to sing forward in a certain way or a spirit led them to, they, you know, it's, you're, you're saying things forward, but then you play it backwards. You can hear backwards words. You can hear them. Um, there was one by uh, ELO, Electrolyte Orchestra. And um, what was the name of this song? But anyway, this guy goes into a little, it, and all that's playing is one guitar, a bass guitar, a drum and him singing, and it's just kind of a low melody thing. Um, but when you play that section backwards, he is the nasty one, Christ, you're infernal. Though it is said we're dead men, everyone who has the mark shall live. I mean, it's just almost plain as day. Almost as plain as I just said it. I, I might do that next Sunday. Because that, that definitely is, I think, something that it is the character of Satan is to draw men back words. Uh, that, that, yeah, I think all of us here have felt the pull to go back into what God brought us out of. Uh, how many times did Israel in the wilderness say, we're going to get somebody to lead us back to Egypt? I mean, half a dozen times at least. Every time something bad happened, we're going back to Egypt. Yeah, and it's like the first thing in their mind is, let's go back to Egypt. And um, 
God said, no, no, we're not doing that. I'm not going to let you do it either. You're going to die here. Ezekiel 28 is where we were last Sunday. And um, I'll just read a portion of this. Uh, let's go to prayer. And then uh, we'll read the scriptures. Father, we ask your blessings now upon your word, upon all of us, Lord, who are hearing it. And I pray, God, that you would give us understanding of our adversary, our, our enemy, arch enemy. Uh, there is no greater enemy to the church of God, to the gospel of grace and salvation uh, than Satan. And Father, give us understanding of his character uh, so that when we see things going in, going along in this world and we're wondering whether this is of you or not, we'll have enough information about you and about our enemy, Satan, so that we will not be misled or fooled in these last days. And so, Father, give us grace and give us light and understanding, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Ezekiel 28 starts out like this. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the, here it is, the prince of Tyrus. So he's a principality. Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. Yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. And again, that is a, if you Right in next to that verse, 2 Thessalonians 2, you are, you are, that is it. They're both connected. Verse 3, behold, thou art wiser than Daniel and wiser than Bud. Some of you will get that later. Anyway, I'll move on. Yeah. Um, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic, there it is, hast thou increased thy riches and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God. Behold, therefore, I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. Notice that. So that, um, I don't know. If I have, surely I've got to have Isaiah 14 in my notes somewhere. Uh, I don't see it. But anyway, um, when we, if you measure that statement, um, they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom and they shall defile thy brightness. Um, the controversy about Isaiah 14 is sort of like what I preached this morning about the name of the Lord. I mean, it's the Lord. Uh, you do, I'm, I'm done. That's it. Right there. His name is the Lord. And that is every place in Scripture bears that out. But there's a controversy over what the name uh, should be. In Isaiah 14, the King James says Lucifer. And if you know someone who is a Satan worshiper <laughs> and um, you were to ask them who Lucifer is, they would tell you and they'd say it's Satan. There's no doubt about it. But, and here again, here come the modern scholars who are going to straighten everything out for everybody because they know more than any human being. And I, I, having been around scholars, professors, I can tell you that the, there is a general attitude of, and with some it's worse than others, but there's a general attitude that the people in the church pews are all dumb, they're, they're ignorant, they don't know anything, they're reading their Bible, and they're getting false information, so therefore we're going we're gonna to straighten everything out for them. We're going to tell them 
that his name is not the Lord. We're going to tell him that his name is Yahweh. We're going to tell him that Lucifer is not the correct translation, that uh, the word there should be morning star. But it's not. It, the word Halel is the word there where it says Lucifer, and it simply means bright. And that's what is here in Ezekiel 28, 7. They shall defile thy brightness. Okay? So Lucifer means light bearer. Okay? So now turn to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. That's how my people used to say 11, 11. And um, if you look then in verse 13, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Angel literally means messenger. A carrier of light, a light bringer, a light bearer. And that's what he is. All of the, if you remember, how was Lucifer decked out? What was covering him? Precious stones. What kind of precious stones? Luminescent stones. I mean, it's not, it's not limestone. It's not sandstone. It's not gravel. Okay, that would be funny. Yeah, if he lost his brilliant coat and God put on him a coat of pavement, asphalt. Anyway, um, Lucifer means light bearer and here he is a light bearer and his, his design, his covering is all these luminescent stones that they don't have their own light, they take the light that shined on them and they reflect it out in different colors, different hues and different patterns and so on. And uh, that's what makes him glisten. That's what makes him glow uh, with this brightness that he has. Okay. So I, I think the, I think second Corinthians 11 gives us a, 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 a capable witness that the name Lucifer is the correct name and the correct thing chosen there. So now in verse 11, uh, moreover, God's going to add some more to this. The word of the Lord came unto me saying, son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. Again, that's a king and the prince is the same thing. And say unto him, thus saith the Lord God. Uh, notice the word God in that verse. Those are all capital letters. That, that means that where it says Lord God, the Lord being in lowercase letters would be the word Adonai. And then um, the capital G-O-D would be the Jehovah, yod heh vah -He. So Adonai Jehovah, the Lord God and and. Basically, you're still dealing with, Lord. It, it doesn't say Lord, Lord. Okay, you would say the Lord God. Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now, I have a little, I don't know what to call it. It's, I guess it's just a theory. When I see where it says, thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Um... I think of the Fibonacci sequence where you have a, a spiral in nature, a spiral pattern in nature, like my ear, okay? It follows a ratio of, of the spiral, starts in here, and the, even in my inner ear, it looks like a French horn, it looks like a trumpet, and it follows that same spiral. Um, Alicia pointed out to me, being smart one day, I was telling her about the Fibonacci sequence and the numbers of that sequence are one, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen. And I was explaining it to her and she says thirty-three. And I said, do what? She said, they add up to thirty-three. 
uh-uh. And she said, yeah, I added them up. Said, yeah, they're 33. So she had to show her daddy up. But anyway, I, I often wonder, thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Anything that has the Fibonacci ratio or sequence to it uh, is, is comely to us. It looks natural. Um, they make these little note cards, three inches by five inches. Those are Fibonacci numbers. Now, if they were to be two inches and five inches, they, we wouldn't, you, they don't look right. They would, be, they would be thin and long, and it's not practical for us. But them being three by five, it's a perfect size for us. Credit cards have that same ratio. Uh, any, like I said, anything in nature or any kind of building, the, all of the old medieval buildings that were made in Europe, whether they were churches or uh, just courthouses or palaces or whatever, most of the time, the architect incorporated the Fibonacci ratio in designing it. And that, of course, matches practically everything on my body. This, the, the length of this part of my finger and this part of my finger is the exact length of this part of my finger. And this part and this part together are the length of my hand. And then, of course, my hand with this part is the length of this part. My nose, the, where my nose is in relation to my eyes, my lips, my chin, all of the... And when somebody has facial features that don't match that, we notice it. We think it looks odd, okay? They didn't want to... I heard this years ago. They didn't want to hire Oprah Winfrey to be on any kind of TV show or anything like that because they said her eyes are too far apart. They are. You look at her and her eyes, especially back... In the early days, her eyes were real far apart. And that just doesn't look good to people. It's not in the ratio. But literally every part of my body is in a perfect ratio. And it's, it's basically perfect in beauty. The spiral of, of, uh, of a sunflower plant. Um, the spiral of a, of a chameleon's tail. The spiral of an elephant's trunk. Uh, the spiral of a galaxy, the spiral of a hurricane, the spiral of water going down the drain, everything in nature and how people design certain things, all of those bear this same sequence and it is comely to us. Like I said, we, we look at that and say that looks good. We don't, know how, we don't know why it looks good, we just think it looks good. And so I've often thought that maybe that's what it was referring to here, when it said, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. All right, enough conjecture. Verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. That goes back to Genesis 3, and we're going to go there next. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. I don't know if you've ever noticed this when you go to a jewelry store. They always have very strong lights pointing right down on the jewelry cases. Why? Because they want them to sparkle because that dazzles our eyes. We like it. We like the sparkle of gold and silver and we like the sparkle of the diamonds and the stones in there. So they sh and they keep them cleaned all the time. They keep the, the glass cases cleaned all the time and the light shining down on there, it just sparkles and we think, oh yeah, I got to have that, got to have that, got to have that. And that's how Lucifer looked when he was in heaven. Um, but needless to say, uh, remember we just read that uh, they shall defile thy brightness. And so does he still look that way? I don't think currently he does. Um, the way we see him in like the book of Revelation, he's a dragon with seven heads and ten horns. Um, he's a serpent back in uh, Genesis 3. So uh, I don't really think that currently he looks that way, but I think at some point he will transform into an angel of light. Um, then uh, at the end of verse 13, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes, 
was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Musical instruments. In Isaiah 14, we saw the vials. Here in Ezekiel 28, uh, tabrets and pipes, percussion instruments, um, horn instruments like trumpets, trombones, baritones, uh, tubas, French horns, uh, reed instruments like a clarinet or an oboe, a flute would be a pipe instrument, and of course, obviously, the pipe organ. In verse uh, 14, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, uh, possibly a reference to Lucifer standing over the Ark of the Covenant from behind, covering God's beauty and God's glory with his wings the way the two cherubims on either side do. And um, he lost that position. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. God gave him that position. Thou wast uh, upon the holy mountain of God, and thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. I, I tried to look that up again uh, to see if somebody on the internet had a good idea of what these stones of fire were. Uh, I don't get it still. Um, one thought, though, did occur to me, if I were to take it literally in, its, in what it says. Um, Everett, you were telling me about if a volcano was like a pizza today. And I really enjoyed that. But lava and magma are stones of fire. They are melted rock is what they are. Um, and something that I could possibly go along with that is that it's, it's now well doc documented and well known that when volcanoes, like the ones in Mexico, when they are in the process of a big eruption where they're just belching out smoke and fire and and magma and everything else, that, uh, that ash going up into the sky creates a static charge and you have volcano-based lightning. It happens a lot. You, if you look this up on Google Images or YouTube, you'll see it. Uh, these, these erupting volcanoes produce flashes of lightning. Well, how did Jesus see... Satan falling as lightning, okay? Now, I don't know if that has anything to do with this. Um, uh, I did read where somebody said what I had mentioned last week about the stones of fire being the planets. I, I, still, don't go along, I still don't go for that because they're not on fire. They're not. Even the gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn, and um, they, have a, they have a solid core, and they have large amounts of, of different gases, but they're not really on fire. So, uh, it, it possibly uh, meteors or um, um, comets or, as I said, uh, volcanoes and lava and so on. But I never did see anything that really satisfied to me uh, what these stones of fire were. In verse 15, Thou was perfect in, the, in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. Um, by the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. An angel that sins does not get a chance to repent. They don't. Um, Jude and Peter talked about this. And the angels that sinned were cast into the prison immediately. And held there until, I think, Revelation 9, I think God lets them out at that time. Um, but clearly, they don't get a chance to repent. They don't get a chance to make things right. Once an angel sins, they're only given one chance. And if they sin, that's it. 
Uh, God doesn't keep them around. And so, um, till iniquity was found in thee. In verse um, 16, halfway through, Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. There it is again. Thine heart, here it is, here's this sin. Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Now, let me throw some things in here where you can, where you can see where Satan has infiltrated and influenced things. Uh, if you've ever gone into a Catholic church, there is no Catholic church that just has plain walls and a ceiling like we do. Every Catholic church that you'll go into, gold everywhere, gold leaf on the walls, on the decorations, Certain of the statues will be in gold or be at least covered with gold on the outside. Um, lights, colored lights coming in, stained glass, uh, any, kind, any way that those things inside that church can be pleasing to the eyes of man, what we call eye candy. We like looking at it. And, I, and I'll never forget the first time I ever stepped foot into a Catholic church. It was with Dennis Nall. He was, we were doing competition down at Cape. And uh, he stopped at a church that he knew about. And he got permission from the priest for us to go in there and sing something. And I was just like, this is beautiful. <gasps> Look at all this. And I could, I could see where people can be drawn in by that. You go into this church and you see all this magnificent, expensive stuff there. Um, I would like to go to uh, St. Peter's Basilica and, and look at it because it's, it is monstrously huge. You can fit 80,000 people inside this thing. In fact, they, they say that if you're, if you're like at that big, looks like a little pavilion inside of it, and that, where the uh, Pope does all of his masses and stuff, you could be there and the Pope or somebody celebrating a mass, and then all the way to the back of it, there could be another service going on. You're in the same room, but you have no idea what they're doing down there. You can't hear them. You, you just barely see them. That's how big this is. And it's, I mean, it's just huge and gold everywhere. And the Vatican, the Vatican Museum is the largest, most expensive collection of stuff in this world from every civilization, every culture, every religion, something like, I don't know, 60 to 80,000 different pieces that they have. Uh, not, not all of them are on view, but... I mean, just the amount of money that this building represents. It is, it is intended that you walk in and just stand in awe because that building to a Catholic is your mother. And they're all designed like a womb. Okay? That building is your mother and you stand in awe and admiration of your mother, the mother church. And I get that. And I think that is inspired by Satan, who likes to look shiny. He likes to be pleasing to people. The fruit on that tree was pleasant to the eyes, the Bible said. And so um, that's, that's Satan. Churches who have a lot of wealthy donors in it will build a place for the congregation to be in that is, has to be one of the most magnificent things that 
that church has ever done. They want something big and gaudy and in your face with all the decorations, the lights, everything. They want it pleasing to the satisfying of your flesh is what it's all about. And that's, that's the devil, that's Satan. It says thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. And that's, I mean, that's the Catholic Church. That's other churches as well. They want to draw people in by their beauty. Say, look at us. Look at, look at this church. And that's, we didn't get that far this morning in Sunday school, but in Ezekiel 16, when God decorated Jerusalem as a, as a wife of his, he made her beauty, beautiful, gave her earrings, gave her pearls, costly array, everything. Well, then she went out and committed whoredoms with all these other nations. And God said, yep, because she liked to look good. She wanted to look pleasing to everybody. And her heart was corrupted because of her beauty. Now, I think we'll have a nice place to worship God. I think we'll have a nice place to uh, to come in and, and sing praises to God. But I can tell you, I've been in churches in Kenya and I've been in some of them where they were just 10 shacks. But the, oh, I tell you what, there was a spirit in there. Such sweet people. They don't have any money. They can't buy silver and gold and all that. And if they had silver and gold, they'd sell it and buy food with it. And... Um, but you can, you can tell a church that is more worried about how they look than how holy they are. And, that's, and they will boast and brag. They will, that, will make, that will be their selling point to people, to get people in. All right. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. And again, I, I say that a church that emphasizes the appearance of the, of the uh, church building itself, of the sanctuary, and emphasizes, this is where we get into fundamentalism, a church that emphasizes the outer appearance of people. Probably doesn't have much on the inside. And I've been in these churches and I will, I will admit that uh, for a long time that was a draw to me. I wanted to look good on the outside. I wanted my hair cut real short. I'm getting a haircut tomorrow. Thank God. I wanted my hair real short. I wanted my appearance to be pleasing to people. I wanted them to see me as Mr. Conservative Christian, Mr. Fundamentalist. And, um, but I've since realized that that corrupts what's on the inside. It corrupts your wisdom. When all you care about is what on, is what on the outside. Um, so, Thine heart was lifted up, verse 17, because of thy beauty, thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness, and I will cast thee to the ground, and I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. When he says, I will cast thee to the ground, again, that's Isaiah 14, how art thou cut down to the ground, which is weak in the nations. So these two are parallels to one another. Verse 18, thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries, look at that, by the multitude of thine iniquities. And so any place that is supposed to be a house of God, a place of worshiping God, if the devil is allowed to be in charge, he will defile that sanctuary and with iniquity. And by the iniquity of thy traffic, therefore will I bring forth the fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Who remembers Rex Humbard? Joe, you remember Rex Humbard? Back many years ago, late 60s, early 70s, on up into somewhere around 1980. He was a, uh, he was, I won't say he was the first ever TV preacher, but he had uh, a pretty good sized television ministry. Um, he hung around 
guys like uh, Kenneth Hagin back in those days. But I could always tell that there is a difference in him. Rex Humbard really did believe that preaching the gospel was the most important thing he could ever do, and that is to win souls so they could be saved. When Rex was a young man, his father was an old-time Pentecostal preacher, and he said, my dad was a good preacher. And he said, uh, when radio really hit and became something that everybody had, he said, I always try to encourage his dad to get on the radio and do his preaching on the radio. And he said, my dad never would do it. He didn't feel like that was the right way to spread the gospel. But Rex did. And as a young man, he takes his guitar and he goes to this radio station and he negotiates something with the owner and gets a pretty good deal. But every week it's Rex Humbard singing and preaching the gospel. And all of a sudden he gets a following. And then he builds a church. And then uh, the donations start coming in. And he starts buying up television time. And um, the more money that came in, the more markets. When I say markets, in about different cities across the country. He would buy into more markets. And so it was nothing for mom to get up on Sunday morning, turn the TV on and, and watch Rex Humbard. I mean, I kind of liked his style back then. Um, but something happened is that he kept wanting to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's where you start running into a problem because the bigger you get, the more money you've got to have coming in. And you don't just rely upon people writing you a check every week, okay, for a million dollars. So he started investing the money. Uh, buying different things that would generate income so he could be on the... Te he was on the television of most of America and Canada, but he wanted to be on TV down in Brazil. He wanted to blanket South America. I mean, he had big dreams. And um, you can see sort of the downfall with him um, because I think he got in trouble with the, with the government or the IRS or something about the money that that his investments were generating like everything wasn't above board or something like that um, Jerry Falwell same thing If you listen to old sermons from Jerry Falwell it's King James King James King James King James and that's what he was all about preaching the gospel from the King James Bible but then he got in with he started this moral majority thing back in the 80s and he started getting into into politics and so on and so on and there was a time when uh, Jerry Falwell was getting money from a lot of places that when, they, when people started looking into it, uh, it looked a lot like the money that was being sent to him was used to control him. Because he had all of these things he had to, he had to fund. He had this Liberty, started out Liberty College, now it's Liberty University. Um, all the TV programs that he had out. I mean, everything. All this stuff costs money. And so that these donations are coming in from all these different sources. And with those donations, you get hooked on them. And all of a sudden now, so September 11th, 2001, September 12th, Jerry Falwell comes out and says, this is an attack. This was God. God sent this thing because this nation, because we're killing our babies. And we're allowing uh, homosexuals to get married. And we're, we're favoring this and favoring sin all over the place. And he, and, uh, he I mean, he just came out strong on this. This is God judging America. And then five days later, he comes out and retracts every bit of that. And the reason is people who wrote checks said, uh, you, need, you need to kind of bring, dial that back a little bit. Or we're not going to send you our money. And that's how it happens. And so by the end of his life, he's espousing all these different false Bibles, the English Standard Version and things like that. His son, who was never born again, never saved, takes over Liberty University. And we know what happened there. Him and his wife were having an affair with the pool guy. And got caught. And 
just bad stuff. And so uh, the board of Liberty University said, we're going to fire you. And he said, well, you're going to fire me according to the contract. He walked away from that with like $10 million. See, see what happens with the money that corrupts, money corrupts. The iniquity of thy traffic, the iniquity of, um, yeah, thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thy iniquities and by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore, I will bring forth a fire from the midst of thee and it shall devour thee and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Um, that's something that I prayed about um, really before uh, this ministry took off was God don't let me chase money. And I, uh, I always took note. We had a couple of people that were donating quite a bit in those early days. And um, the Holy Ghost was always like, Mike, watch them. Watch out for them. And sure enough, one lady was sending us $1,000 every month. And uh, man, we weren't used to that. And I didn't know uh, anything about her. Didn't know who she was. Uh, and I came out one day against Jesse Jackson and against Al Sharpton. And she wrote me a, a mean email saying, those are godly men. Those are God's men. And I'm like, no, they're not. And then she said to me, I donate such and such to your ministry. I don't care. In fact, you just... You just put your name on a list, is what you did. And then there was another family. They were giving us like two grand a month back in those early days. And sure enough, they tried to uh, try to control me with that money. And when I wouldn't do it, when I wouldn't do what, it was her. It was the wife, not the husband. When I wouldn't do what she said, they said, well... That we got a call one day or a letter saying, please take us off your mailing list. Well, I knew what that was. I knew exactly what it was. We're not giving you any, we're not giving you a dime anymore. You know what? Thank you. I'm glad you're not because now I don't have to worry about it. Uh, but that's what happens. And um, always, always pray for me and always pray that I, I mean, I'm still doing it, still doing the ministry and all the things. But I don't, I don't want anybody to use that and say, well, I donate such and such to your ministry, so you ought to listen to me. Please, please don't do that to me because we will part company on that day. Uh, all right, now turn to Genesis. Oh, my goodness, it's already quitting time. I should give more Bible and less stories. Matthew, don't say that to me. No, it wasn't Roy. Roy would never talk to me that way. Mm -hmm. Little Matthew. All right, we'll, we'll start in on this and then pick it up next Sunday. Now the serpent. Uh, and so, let's assume some things here, okay? We don't, we don't really know what or when Satan was created, although I have my idea of it. I think all of the angels were created on day four. That's what I think. Um, it, number one, it matches... Ephesians 6, the four groups of, of devils. Um, all the stars are created on day four. Angels are stars, including Lucifer, a falling star. And um, so I, that's what I think. Now, what we also don't have between Genesis 2 and Genesis 3 is how long Adam and Eve were in the garden. We don't, we don't have a record of that. 
And basically, when God doesn't say something, move on, okay? I mean, it could have been weeks, could have been months. I, I doubt that it was more than that, but it, I mean, it could have been. But we know that um, what we just witnessed in Ezekiel 28 has already occurred. The fall of Lucifer from his exalted position. The, the, being the anointed cherub to being the fallen angel. And so we know that's already taken place. And he manifests here the way that he really looks. And that's something to get into people's minds. We've been eating deviled ham for too long. And so, does anybody here like deviled ham besides me? I do. We've been eating deviled ham for too long and devil's food cake and whatever. And so this red character with a pitchfork and an arrow for a tail doesn't, it's not him. Okay, that's not him. He is a serpent, a dragon, a leviathan. He's, fire comes out of his mouth, steam shoots out of his nostrils, sparks come out of, underneath his tongue. All the things the Bible says about leviathans and dragons and serpents are here. The poison is in his mouth, not his tail. It's in his mouth, and that poison is coming out here. And that's what he did. Some people, let me just look over in, in Genesis 4 real quick. Verse 1, Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. There is a theory out there, and it's not, it's not very... To me, it's not very well thought out. It says that Cain's seed, Cain's person, came as a result of the devil mating with Eve. Okay? And they... And they it's, that is used for various... Um, various bigotries. Because one group will say that Cain was the evil seed of Satan and when God marked him, he turned his skin black and made his hair curly. And so all the black people are the evil seed of Cain, which is stupid because Cain's lineage was wiped out in the flood. There are no descendants of Cain anywhere. Okay? But that's what people will do. They will, they will ascribe to some race that they don't like and say that they're, they're, they're of Cain. And Cain, you know, the devil had, you know, the, with Eve. And that's where Cain came from. And I look at that verse 1 of chapter 4 again. I'm going, okay, what do you not see there when it says, Adam knew Eve and she said she got a, a kid from the Lord. Satan's not mentioned here anywhere. Okay. But what we know he did was speak to her. Same that he does with us. He tells us things. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Meaning you couldn't hear his footsteps. Because he had feet at the time. You couldn't, it's like a cat. You never hear a cat coming. Okay? They got pads and stuff on their feet. You never see him. You never know he's there until it's too late. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said... You should not eat of every tree of the garden. Number one, he questions God's word. Question mark. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you should not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. With her saying that, this is why there are no female authors of any book of the Bible. There are no female apostles. Um, she blatantly added a rule to God's word. In other words, let's say that, let's say that the God's commandment to not eat this tree was part of his gospel to Adam and Eve, how God was going to save them. When they, if they did not eat of the tree, they were given access to the tree of life and would have lived for as long as they had access to the tree of life. So that was their gospel. She 
women are types of churches in the Bible. She is a church that takes what God says and says, that's really good, but they add something else to it. Like I was talking about a while ago, being uh, Mr. Fundamental and thinking that if all the women wore dresses and all of us men had really short hair, uh, and we looked good on the outside, uh, that's what God wanted. And if you don't, and I've had, I've had preachers tell me this. The, you know, if, if a woman wears slacks or anything like that, it's obvious they're not saved. It's obvious they're not born again. I know preachers that have said that. They added works to grace. They added it. You don't add something to what God said. She did it. She added, neither shall you touch it. God never said that. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. A direct contradiction of God's word. First of all, question it. Secondly, contradict it. Thirdly, for God doth know. Offer an alternative to God's gospel, to God's word. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. The 33rd word that Satan says is eyes. I always thought that was interesting. Eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So next Sunday, I'm going to bring the entire volume of um, Manly Hall's Secret Teaching of All Ages and read it from the beginning to the end. And I'm going to show you that every religion in the world that the devil has dreamed up and people all over the world is basically this mystery doctrine right here. That if you do this certain thing and partake of this thing, then man will become gods in that day. Man will have his eyes open. He will have an awakening. He will have an awareness. He will have his third eye opened. He will have his pineal gland activated and all of these things and, and man will be transformed into divine supermen. That's uh, uh, Rosicrucian doctrine. The men will be, will men, mankind will evolve and become God men in these days. Okay, let's stand to our feet. I won't really bring all of... of uh, Secret teachings. I'll bring just a few short paragraphs.